What's up, data folks, and welcome to another episode of Data Creators Club podcast. And I'm super pumped today because we have a guest that's coming from my dear homeland, Belgium, where we do have the best beer in the world. There is no discussion about that. Yes. So welcome, Chris. Thank you, Midi. It's a pleasure being here. So Chris founded uh, a data consultancy eight years ago already now called Data Minded. And I know what you're thinking, the audience, what media are you really want to have consultants on the show? Uh, well, I can guarantee you that Chris and Data Minded are really, truly passionate about what they do uh, and helping the community in multiple ways. And we'll touch on that later. But Chris, can you tell me how you got into data first and what's your journey with data minded so far? Yeah, yeah, sure. Actually, my uh, first job out of school, I, I worked at a small company um, called Ino, and it was a semantic search um, company back in 2005. I'm getting old. Um, and back then, we there was no cloud or something, but back then we were already like getting maximum performance out of a MySQL server and doing quite advanced lookups and it was all C++ back then. Um, so I really enjoyed that part, but but I didn't really make the link with data analytics yet. Um, so I moved on from that startup. I, I joined a few other companies as a software developer. And at some point I landed with a large American uh, consultancy company. Um, and there was really cool. We were, um, I was part of a software developer, technology specialist at a solutions team. So we did call all kind of data analyses and building data solutions, data platforms, data insights for large, uh, for large um, Fortune 500 companies, and I really, really enjoyed that. There, my my love for data uh, was born, I would say, and, and then I realized like this is what I want to do. I want to do software engineering in data. Um, but that was 2009, something like that. 2000, yeah, 2010 maybe. It was really Probably early, yeah, huh? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, um, that was before. I, I remember it was before Tableau existed because we built our own version of Tableau, so to speak. And then <laughs> Tableau was released. It's like mm, we have to throw all of that away. <laughs> uh, but we did Microsoft SQL Server back then, and and yeah, Kimball data modeling. So it was a bit more um, traditional than what we would do today. But then I realized, like, mm, I, I really like this data analytics thing, but. Uh, the problem was in that firm is that we we were the second rank citizens. So we only had to execute what the fancy consultants told us. And, and that's why I started with Data Minded. Is, um, I think it started in 2014, yeah, so eight years ago now. Is I wanted to do software engineering in the data world, but with the engineers front and center. I didn't want to like those fancy consultants making slides and then throwing all the stuff over the fence to us. Like I wanted to be front and center. I want to be middle of the action. We also have an academy uh, part where we teach people around data engineering. So we teach Airflow, DBT, Python, Spark, a uh, bit of uh, Docker, uh, all those things. And then we also have a product in the market uh, called Conveyor. And that's in the data infrastructure space. It's self-service compute and workflow management. Uh, yeah, so, so we diversified a bit over those eight years, but that's, that's, how, we, that's how I came into data. Nice. No, but it's, I mean, that's really amazing because yeah, for m me, I came a bit later and it's already like, seems like really early, right? You, when you see yeah. all the profiles today, they have like passion to data after already a life of a job, right? That can be anything. I had like cameraman as ex-colleague, uh, you know, uh, which turned into data scientist, lawyer, uh, but you, you were really already uh, quite early on the track. I should see how how crazy fast the data world moves, right? Whatever was cool five years ago um, is completely not cool anymore today. And it's it's insane, actually, the, the velocity, the, the speed of innovation also brings its own challenges. But I think it's it's a fantastic time to be in data, right? Like if you were in data in the 90s, all you did was build OLAP cubes. Um, you could do that for a decade and then build a Cognos report on top of something. Now you have so many completely different use cases, completely different technology stacks, completely different needs from businesses and that that's what makes it exciting as well there was a conference a data conference yeah. pretty back then um and you mentioned like okay uh managing like an, an on-premise cluster right is really you need an entire team and today you can do it like that with one basically command which was just an aws uh, cli command yeah to launch an emr cluster 
Yeah. Um, that didn't talk to me right back then because I didn't feel it like I was not involved yet in the cloud. And I think it was it's still really early for uh, most of the company, especially, uh, you know, all company, uh, banking company. So can you touch a bit on the general adoption of the things you've been seeing those past eight years? Because yes, like the, the, the technology in general is moving fast, but how the adoption is going on the average company, I would say. Uh, so because yeah, well, we see the, the thing is that we see things on, 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 on Medium from Netflix and Airbnb, right? But it's, yeah. it's like, what's, what's your reality? Yeah, the, 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 there is this quote that the, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed, right? So some companies like indeed Netflix and Airbnb are already doing the massive cool stuff. But the average company, I, I know of a telco in Belgium, a large telco that we would all know, where we they did their own workflow management. They, they invented their own tool to do workflow management. And we introduced, I think, back in 2016, like, hey, there's an open source project called Airflow. It already existed back then. It does this for you off the shelf. You don't need to build this yourself. But we couldn't convince them. It was like, no, 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 you can't. No, we do this ourselves. And now, so many years later, 2022, they still haven't adopted a workflow management solution. It doesn't have to be Airflow. I don't care about that, right? But they're still doing it themselves. So um, if you talk about adoption in real companies, it's it's there is a very, very large distribution. Um, and, and on the one hand, you see like media companies, energy companies, and sometimes even banks going full force ahead in cloud and doing quite advanced things in cloud. They're adopting Kubernetes. They're adopting things like Snowflake or Databricks or ML platforms like SageMaker, DataRobot, all, all those things. Um, on the other hand, you still have companies that are struggling just, yeah, really to get the basics right. To to to, um, they're still like nowadays. I would call being stuck in the Hadoop page because th that's how they feel as well. Like when you now talk to companies still using Hadoop, they they really feel they're locked in, because a couple of years ago you had uh, Mapart, um, um, Hortonworks, and Cloudera, for and then you had some competition in the field. Now you only have Cloudera, so so they they. They really feel locked in with the dupe and they try to escape, but it's really hard for them to go to cloud. Um, and then if you look at the other end of the spectrum, I've always been a, a massive cloud fanboy. I still am. I, I, I believe, like what I talked at a conference, like instead of setting up a Cloudera cluster where you need two uh, full-time um, infrastructure engineers to keep it up and running and your hardware and whatever, and uh, now you can just do AWS EMR start or whatever. You could schedule a job. That is true, but I actually also realized that in an enterprise level, it's not really true. Um, why is because, and you, you probably notice if you work in enterprise cloud environments, you have different teams running different cloud accounts um, and each cloud account needs to have its own setup with CloudWatch, with IAM, with a landing zone, with, with a whole bunch of VPC setup. And and sometimes I think like, yes, we, we um, we don't have the waiting time anymore of six months to a year to get the on-premise cluster installed. But now we just have to wait or we have to build six months to a year to get all the Terraform set up to get our cloud data platform <laughs> set up. Yeah. So, so cloud data platforms are also becoming, in my opinion, our industry is making them way too complex. And we need to simplify them again. I'm, I'm really convinced that spending a year, two years building cloud data platforms with all the enterprise complexity that goes with it that doesn't work anymore. So, so yeah, the, the future I think is maybe even not not 100% cloud anymore. Um, maybe you, you're looking at open at, at um, on-premise solutions with technologies like OpenShift um, or technologies like um, Starburst or Snowflake. I know Snowflake is not on-premise, but more end-to-end -end solutions that does something for you and less building of, I have an empty Amazon account and I start adding an EMR here and an S3 bucket there and a glue catalog there. I, I think that that those individual building blocks, like building a cloud data platform from scratch, that, that's going, that's too complex today. No? Uh, so, so, so your point, coming back to uh, the, how, how mature the company are in data, you have yeah. basically saying it's completely differently distributed. So for a same like all companies, same sector, Actually, depending on the leadership and the, the C-level management, you could have some people uh, doing fast adoption than the others, right? 
Definitely. And uh, yeah. And and why 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 is that actually? Because like yeah, is there any specific reason behind? We we published what we call a data maturity index, and that you can find on our website. You can download for free, but doesn't really matter. But the the, the point of that was to look at how mature are companies in adopting data to really drive strategic decisions and to really have well differentiate from competition if you will and bring innovative products using data and we saw like in the one dimension you have technology like you need you need to have the, the nerds like us to build this for you but but actually a lot of companies already invest quite a lot in technology right they, they already do that um but there are a lot of other dimensions that um really um drag companies down if you will so for instance a very classical one is that they they build state of the art technology with fancy consultants and they pay a lot of money and blah but then they don't invest in redesigning their process they keep their same on premise very very waterfall process with with silo teams like you have your data engineers here your scientists there your analysts there your business team somewhere else Um, and then they see like, hey, but we have all these technologies now, but we still have the same process and we're not winning anything. Or they still have, um, they don't invest in people. They don't invest in training of their people. So you have this awesome technology stack and then the consultants leave and nobody can maintain it or run it, right? And and that's also for us a pity, right? Because yes, we might have been paid to do the setup of the cloud platform, but then if it's not really being used or not maintained, then we also feel like we we failed, right? So yeah. Yeah. Their companies, um, um, I think at sea level, um, there is awareness that, yes, we want to do more with data. Everybody talks about, yeah, yeah, we need to do more with data, but it's very hard to actually execute on that, right? Like across all dimensions to really, um, really get value from data. You need more than just set up a fancy cloud platform, throw in some AI and machine learning algorithms and then think that you're all of a sudden data yeah. driven. It really takes a cultural change a process change in your organization and that that is hard that is super hard yeah so no matter which like uh, there is a fancy saying don't know who said that like uh, engineering is easy people are hard right and yes. i think maybe there is a shortcut in um, in those company thinking that uh, actually it's just a technology problem right we cannot handle big data yeah. on a single machine so we just need an on premise cluster and that will solve it yeah. If you fail in engineering, your infrastructure fails or your pipeline fails. It's very obvious that you're yeah. failing. But if you do a poor data strategy exercise, then you can invest millions in the wrong direction. Yeah, and I, and I think there is um, something I, I I see I saw when I moved from like classic corporate to tech company is that tech company are more also focused on the products for survival stake. So like a yeah. classic uh, bang or like it's like a big boat, right? They've been generating revenues and say, oh, how can we, you know, leverage that that all of data? But it's not like, okay, if that project fail, uh, their entire business will fail. It, 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 but in tech company, it is, right? It's like heavily uh, depending on it. And so I feel like this... Um, this uh, semantic layer uh, with what which value do you do you bring it is a bit stronger but still i feel like as soon as the tech company is growing then we are coming back to to the same whole problem yeah i, I mean having not enough money is stressful for a company uh, and difficult but it does keep you focused um, while on the other hand uh, having too much money like Um, that is also bad. I've seen it a few times at a few companies. They, they really had infinite budgets. So you could do whatever, whenever, and, and they were building the most crazy stuff. But always, 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 I've seen it consistently. At some point, somebody will start looking at the budget and say, hey, we're spending millions here. I don't see ROI. Um, what's happening? And then it's usually, yeah, a very sad day for the data team because they realize that, Everybody with the best intentions, right? There was nobody, nobody trying to sabotage the company. Everybody with the best intentions realized that they actually never talked to business users. That's so insane, by the way, that, that I, I work, for instance, at a railway company, and yet those IT and data engineers, they would never, they would never take a train to see like what is actually the day-to-day -day logistics and operations of a train, for instance. Like, like sometimes data teams are so far removed from reality, then it really hits them very hard. Like, ah, 
there is no infinite budget for this. And we actually need to deliver value to the organization. And delivering value is way more than building the machine learning model. It's actually also putting that in production and maintaining it. And Jesus Christ, uh, making sure all the libraries are up to date and fixing a security patch. And, oh, man. Uh, and and Coming back to the data maturity yeah. index. So uh, what is it exactly? Can you can you tell us a bit uh, a bit more? Yeah, sure. So if you if you go to um, dataminder.com, there is a um, um, there's a link somewhere on the resources you can find uh, data maturity index, um, and it's a survey you can take. It asks you a bunch of questions um, uh, across six dimensions. So it asks you about your organization, your people, your processes, your data, um, your technology, and I'm forgetting a sixth one. Um, yeah, whatever <laughs> the sixth dimension there, um, um, and it checks how well you're doing across all these six dimensions and gives you a score back. Um, now, that score is not perfect, um, but it is a starting point for discussion. So you can then download a white paper that we have that describes what do we call a super mature company, for instance, in in um, organization, if C-level leadership makes strategic decisions based on data in day to day then you're very mature. If you have a good data strategy that is linked to your business strategy, then as an organization, you're very mature. If you're building out a vision around data mesh, it doesn't have to be like the religion data mesh, but ideas around data mesh, then you're very mature. Um, if you're not very mature, it's not a bad thing, by the way, to, to not be mature, then you're doing things like, yeah, we have some BI reports, but only the finance department uses it, right? And and that's it. And it, it, it the score should give you an idea of um, okay, I'm, I've already typically what we see a lot is they invest already a lot in technology, but they haven't invested a lot in processes and people, right? So instead of putting more efforts in our cloud efforts, maybe we should rethink the process of how we how we build data products or data projects or whatever, or we should train our internal people to know more about cloud before we hire more consultants, right? Um, and so we launched that um, as a result of work we did with clients. We also used to do what we call data strategy exercises with clients. And it, it's definitely not the truth, but it's a very good basis for discussion. Moving on, um, on other things you've been uh, doing uh, for the tech community, there was this data engineer manifesto. I share it yeah. multiple times in my with my previous teams. So why did you build that? And uh, yeah, could you su summarize it like quickly? Yeah, yeah, sure. So the, the reason why we built it is that um, data engineering is is often sometimes uh, is is often seen as the the plum the plumbing of data systems, right? Like the the rock stars are the data scientists, and they score the goals, and they build the fancy AI models, and they they have all the success with business. And by the way, I'm fine with that, right? So 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 I'm really fine with as an engineer, you're in the serving role, you serve other people, you make sure. Like your scientists and your analysts are successful. Like like that, I, I really like doing that. But it also means that the job of an engineer is sometimes a bit obscure. Like they don't, honestly, business doesn't really care, right? Just get the plumbing right, make sure that the pipes work, make sure there's data coming through. Um, and yeah, don't don't bother me. That, that's that's sometimes the, the 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 frustrating part of being a data engineer, I think. And so we we set up a set of guidelines that says, hey, I think if you if you look at data engineering in this way, again, it's not the truth or something, just like the data maturity index wasn't the truth. But this is how we look at data engineering, let's put it like that. And I think that's how data engineering can be successful in, in organizations. And so um, to quickly summarize, um, uh, we had nine principles. So the first one is we are software engineers. So, so that means data engineering is just software engineering applied to data. And in that respect, by the way, I think and and it's 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 bad um, it's bad publicity, if you will. But I think data engineers are typically a lot less mature than software engineers. If you if you talk to an average software engineer, um, they typically do things like CI CD. They do that quite well. Code reviews. They do. That. They're not perfect, right? I know that, but. <laughs> But I know plenty data teams who don't write a single unit test. I know plenty data teams yeah. that deploy code by just dragging and dropping jar files from their laptop to a cluster, right? So, so, so we are we are software engineers, and we should learn from what software engineers are doing. The entire data mesh thing, 
it's so obvious in hindsight. I love the idea, but it's so obvious in hindsight. It's just what the domain-driven design community has been doing for years already, yeah. for decades even. Yeah. Like all of a sudden, we, like the kind of retarded people, like, mm, maybe we should start <laughs> doing that. Like, and, and again, I don't, I don't want to downplay data mesh. I'm super cool, uh, but it's it's like, why are we only discovering this yeah. now? Are we, no, no. are we the slow kids in the class, right? But so, <laughs> yeah, but so, so this is something I, I heard you often say, like software engineer, like since our talk, uh, since yeah. you talked about data minded, and I think uh, it's a strong and important statement because there is a lot of data consulting company, right? Uh, where they more into, you know, dashboard and analytics, but they don't see really um, the whole flow also as an engineering problem. Moving on on the open source side. Um, yeah. So you, data minded in general has been putting quite some repository on the open source. Uh, I wanted to have your take on um, data open source in general, and like uh, being also giving also your view on like being a maintainer of a mm. data project mm. that you want to grow. Yeah, it's um, it's a blessing and a curse to be honest. Uh, open source. Um, uh, I mean, it's a blessing first and foremost because without open source, the data community wouldn't be where we are today, right? If, the, if there would be no open source, we would still be working with the Oracle and the Microsoft SQL databases of um, uh, 2004. Um, it's thanks to t technologies like Spark, DBT, Kubernetes, Python. I mean, I, you can go on and on and on, but how many awesome open source projects have completely changed the data landscape? Yeah. Um, and I think that is super amazing. And, and um, you say that we contribute to open source and we do, but definitely not enough. If there's one thing that I hope we can do more with data mind is, is bring more open source innovation. Because that's the, I would say, downside to open source of the, the, the risk is um, sometimes you publish something, but then it becomes abandoned where we had that as well. Like you, yes, it's available. The source code is available, but nobody's actually maintaining it anymore. Nobody's up upgrading libraries. Uh, nobody is, is adding new features. And then if you use it as a client, you're kind of stuck with, with something that doesn't work anymore. So, so if you're navigating that open source landscape, um, sometimes you make good bets. Like we betted on Airflow already in 2014 or 2015, like a year after the company, like when it was still managed by Airbnb before it was Apache. And, and that was a good bet because Airflow was still around. But we also betted, for instance, on NiFi. We were big believers of Apache NiFi. I don't know if you heard of that. Yeah, yeah. Now it, it's not abandoned. Where I mean, NiFi is still being upgraded, but it, let's just say it wasn't it wasn't a great fit for yeah. us. The downside of open source is that it, it does require a lot of maintenance. Um, yeah. um, and and there I, I I sometimes struggle because if you look at technologies like Snowflake, it's not open source. Yeah. But it just works. It's yeah. super expensive, but it just works. So. But I, I think I, maybe sometimes we are lacking of a business incentive. Uh, in the open source, I think GitHub has been trying to push features, you know, with this open source thing, because at the very end, if you look at the uh, uh, data open source product like Airflow, it literally been taken by you know astronomer now, which is really yeah. driving everything. But I think it if that didn't happen, uh, I don't see like they, like there is a lot of Apache project that just die at certain point. And, I, and like, if you took the other example with Spark, uh, it's an Apache project, but still, it's driven by you know business company. Um, so, so I think yeah, maybe a business incentive would would help. I don't know. Yeah, and 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 but, but to to expand on Spark, so the, all the like I love Databricks as a company. They bring a lot of innovation, but they do it first and foremost to serve themselves. Mm -hmm. And only in a later stage, like like for instance with with Delta, yeah. in a later stage they open source yeah, more yeah. of them, right? And now they have this new photon. I understand it. I like like it's they have this new photon engine to to run SQL queries on Spark a lot faster than open source Spark. But they don't do it. I mean, they don't do it to help the open source community, right? They, they do it mainly to make boatloads of money. And and then you see, for instance, um, I don't know if you know the tool Redash. I really yeah. love Redash as a tool. It's been bought by Databricks, yeah. and then the commit, commit history. If you look at the commit history, like it, it's dead. Now it's part of Databricks, of course, but they, they really just 
killed an entire open source project is this and i'm, I'm not saying databricks is bad here but the, the 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 there is a tension between what you want to get as a business and what is for the best interest of the open source community yeah i mean it's a good reminder right because mm -hmm. we're always preaching open source thing and so on but i think there is a backstage which is sometimes pretty dark <laughs> i think we still need to find the right balance between um, yeah. Uh, the business and the and the survivability, the maintainability of a, of an open source project. Mm. Cool. Um, closing up slowly. Uh, meetups. You've been really active in the data community yeah. in general. So we spoke about the project. There is also uh, a blog of Data Minded where you've been writing also yeah. uh, over there. Um, so go check it out. Uh, but like the data science meetup community. Can you talk us like? What value do you think uh, there is in putting so much effort like yourself in organizing it? Yeah, I, um, uh, it's a good question. I, I didn't know it would be it would be so long lasting and successful, to be honest. But the idea behind the Data Science Leuven community was we already had a Data Science Brussels community and I think already a Data Science Ghent. I'm, yeah, I think Ghent already yeah. existed. And I love those communities, but I didn't like traveling <laughs> and commuting and standing. Come on, it's Belgium. <laughs> yeah, but come on. You know how the Brussels <laughs> Ring Road is it's horrible. So it's like, we should have that in Leuven. So I created it together with five other people. And from the beginning, it was a very idea that we shouldn't have to work very hard. So it would always be three speakers. It would always be the same format in the same location um, and beers afterwards. And I don't want to do any sponsorship or... Like crazy money deal. So we found a very nice location in Leuven in Stuck. That was relatively low effort, to be honest. Um, you just, the, you you find the speakers quite naturally because people just want to talk to the community. And it really gave me the opportunity. So what is the win for me? It gave me the opportunity to meet a lot of people. Um, some of them joined Data Minded as an engineer. Some of them became clients. Others just became good friends. So I, for me, it's really, a, it's a no brainer to keep on doing that. As long as people keep on showing up and at, at Data Science Leuven, I will keep organizing it because I um, I learn a lot from it as well. It's really cool to see what others are doing in the, in the data science and data engineering space. Thank you very much uh, for being on the show, Chris. Um, it was amazing. We'll put all the links uh, in the description about the blog of Data Minded, uh, the Data Engineer Manifest uh, um, and the Data Maturity Index. I got it. Yeah. And of course, the data science uh, meetup uh, in Leuven. So if you're listening and you're in Leuven and you don't know about that one and you work in data, then you probably live in a cave. But I think it's good to know and check it out. Yeah, yeah. very welcome in the next Data Science Leuven and, and talk uh, over beers. Cool. Thank you, Chris. See you. Thank you, Mary. It was a pleasure meeting you. <laughs>